do a virtual pig dissection. Um, and if you have any questions while we're doing the virtual pig dissection, please feel free to unmute yourself and stop me, um, or you can put your questions in the chat and I'll be looking at that as well. Um, does anybody know before we get started why we do pigs? They're the most, um, relative. Yeah, so that's exactly right. Um, so pigs, whenever you cut them open, so what, like what we're going to see in a little bit is they look the most like humans. So their organs are in the same places as humans are. Um, they look about the same and they do pretty much the same functions. So pigs are very similar to human anatomy in that way. So this is what a fetal pig looks like. Um, so normally if we were to do this in person, you'd have your pig in front of you, you and a partner. Um, to be able to cut it open and look at all the organs inside, but this is an even better way to do it because you don't have the smell that a lot of people don't like. Um, so the reason we do fetal pigs is because they are the most like humans. Um, so the first system that we're going to talk about um, is the digestive system. So the digestive system is responsible for um, being able to for an organism to be able to process food. So whenever you eat food, you want to get all the good stuff out of it. You want to get your vitamins, your nutrients, um, and your carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, because all of those things are responsible for keeping you alive, to keep your cells alive so that you can perform functions of your life um, and be nourished. So the first organ that we're going to talk about um, is the esophagus. So the esophagus is the big long tube that you're going to see right in the middle of this pig. It is responsible for getting food from your mouth to your stomach. So whenever you put food in your mouth and you start to chew it and you chew it up, it creates something called chyme. And so that's partially digested food. So whenever you start chewing your food, you start the digest digestive process. Then when you swallow it, it goes down your esophagus, which is a flexible tube by um, motions called peristalsis. So basically your esophagus looks like this, but to squeeze the food down, it moves in a wave-like motion to squeeze the bits of food all the way down the tube to get to your stomach. It also has um, basically what I like to think of as a trap door at the top of it. So your Food and air both go in, this in into your mouth, but you don't want air to go in your stomach and you don't want food to go into your lungs. So the epiglottis serves as like a trap door to make sure that whenever you are eating, food doesn't go down your trachea, which is like your windpipe, to go to your lungs. So it makes sure that food only goes into your esophagus and doesn't go anywhere else. So the times where you've ever um, tried to eat or drink anything really fast and you've gotten choked on it, um, sometimes that can be where a little bit of food or a little bit of water gets into your windpipe or gets into places where food shouldn't be. The next organ we're going to talk about is the liver. So the liver is very large in pigs and in people. Um, it looks a lot like that. It's just located in a little bit of a different spot. So it's located in the right upper quadrant of your abdomen. So if you take your abdomen and you draw a T on it, you have um, upper quadrants and you have lower quadrants. And on the right side, on the upper part of your abdomen, right below your rib cage, is where your liver is located. So your liver does a whole lot of things. Um, it's responsible for what we call detoxifying your blood. So if you um, ingest toxins that um, your, liver, your liver is responsible for filtering your blood, to get rid of those toxins to make sure that your blood is um, clean. So for example, if someone drinks a lot of alcohol for an extended period of time, so throughout their whole life, it can damage your liver because your liver is responsible for cleaning your blood. And if you drink a lot of alcohol and it, that gets in your blood, your liver has to do all the work to clean it out. Your liver also uh, for digestive purposes is responsible for creating a substance called bile. So bile is um, a substance made by the liver, stored in the gallbladder, and it is responsible for digesting fats. So whenever you eat 
um, your McDonald's cheeseburger and your large French fries and your large milkshake, that has a lot of fat in it. And so we would have to break down those fats to be able to digest them in the body. And so bile is responsible for doing that. So the gallbladder uh, is where bile is stored. It's the green little balloon that you see. It, um, its sole purpose is to store and secrete bile. So whenever your liver makes bile, it's transported to the gallbladder for storage. And so bile actually looks greenish yellow, which is why the gallbladder is that color. Whenever you eat a, a meal that's high in fat, your gallbladder then goes to work. So it says, oh, your body says, we are eating fat, we need bile to help digest those fats. Then your gallbladder will contract. So it's like a balloon. And when it squeezes, it squeezes um, bile out to then be in the digestive system to help break down those fats. Now, as you might know, you can live without your gallbladder. So your gallbladder can um, be non-functional for whatever reason and can cause a lot of pain if you eat um, foods that have a lot of fat in them. So if your gallbladder has um, either gallstones or any other reason why your gallbladder would need to be removed, um, a doctor can look at you and run some tests to know that your gallbladder is not functioning correctly and you can they can go into a surgery, get rid of your gallbladder, and you can still survive. So you can't live without your liver, you um, can't really live without your esophagus, but you can live without your gallbladder. And you can still eat foods that have fat in them. Um, it just takes a little bit of time for your body to basically adjust to not having your gallbladder. The next organ we're gonna talk about is the stomach. So the stomach, is the big pink balloon that you'll see here. Um, it's responsible for lots of things, um, mechanical digestion. So your stomach wall is made of muscles and so your stomach will contract. So the food that gets into your stomach as your stomach's contracting is mechanically breaking down that food. So it um, will grind it up. And it also is responsible for chemical digestion. So chemical digestion is when stomach acid is secreted by cells in the lining of the stomach and that acid will chemically break down food. So your stomach does mechanical and chemical digestion. The reason that uh, we need mechanical and chemical digestion is because the food that you see on your plate in front of you isn't 100% um, isn't the in the same form that it needs to be to extract all of the vitamins and the minerals and the nutrients that need to come out of your food. So mechanical and chemical digestion are responsible for breaking down those foods into ways that your body can use um, the energy and the vitamins and minerals and nutrients that is in food. So your stomach um, is connected to your esophagus. So once you eat your food, you chew it up, you swallow it, it goes down the esophagus and then gets to the stomach where mechanical and chemical digestion takes place. The next um, organ is the small intestine. So the small intestine um, you'll see kind of looks like a big tube that is jumbled up all on each other. So um, your small intestine, if you were to stretch it out from end to end, is very, very long. So it's a really long tube that gets all um, squished up and tangled up in your abdomen. And it's named the small intestine because of the diameter. So it's small, it's a small tube in diameter, but it's really long if you were to stretch it out. Your small intestine um, also does a lot of chemical digestion. So it has um, enzymes and um, other, secretions that come from the small intestine that are responsible for breaking down food. So as your food um, leaves the stomach, it enters the small intestine. So as your food is traveling down the small intestine, which again is a really long tube, the inside of that tube isn't perfectly smooth. So it's not like a garden hose, where if you look in, inside that tube, it's perfectly smooth and you can see out the other side. The inside of your small intestine is lumpy and it's bumpy 
and it's got ridges and creases and um, all of those ridges and creases and, and creases increase surface area. So the surface area inside your small intestine is huge because it's a super long tube and it's all convoluted and um, lumpy and bumpy. So all of your food that has to travel along the small intestine travels along the entirety of the surface area inside of your small intestine. And your small intestine has cells called villi and microvilli, which kind of look like fingers. So if you were to see a really, really magnified version of the inside of your small intestine, you would see tiny little fingers. And those villi are responsible for reabsorbing all of the good stuff from your food. So all of the protein, all of the um, carbohydrates, all of the good fats, all of your vitamins and minerals get reabsorbed through the small intestine. And the reason you want it to be so long with all of that surface area is because it makes it a more efficient process. So if your food is traveling a very long way, then it has much more chance for all of the good stuff to be reabsorbed by the time it gets to the end of that tube. So after it leaves the small intestine, it goes into another tube, which is called the large intestine. So the large intestine is named so because of its diameter as well. So it's a bigger tube around. So if you were to look inside the large intestine, it's a larger tube compared to the small intestine, which is smaller. Your large intestine is mainly um, responsible for reabsorbing water and other nutrients. So when the food leaves your small intestine, it's still very watery. And um, as you know, people need water and need hydration to be able to survive. So the large intestine reabsorbs the water out of your food and creates waste. So the parts of your food that can't be um, absorbed by the small intestine can then be um, compacted to in the large intestine to then exit as fecal matter. Um, and the reabsorption of the water helps people to stay hydrated. So certain diseases can directly impact the large intestine. So um, one example of that is um, cholera. So a long time ago, um, and in places where water sources aren't clean, um, cholera is found in unclean water, and it has something specifically called the cholera toxin. And cholera toxin attacks the large intestine and prohibits water from being reabsorbed. So if water doesn't come out of the large intestine and isn't reabsorbed into the body, then it stays inside that tube and then comes out the other end. So basically, if you're not reabsorbing water, you're creating large amounts of diarrhea. And so people with cholera develop um, major diarrhea that they cannot control, and then it causes them to become dehydrated because all of the water that they're ingesting, whether it's in food or in drinks, is then coming out the other end, and they're not able to absorb any of the um, water that they are taking in. The next organ we're going to talk about is the pancreas. So the pancreas um, is also part of the endocrine system. Um, it, so it functions in the endocrine system and it functions in the digestive system. Your pancreas breaks down uh, or secretes enzymes to help break down proteins. Um, and it also helps to um, create one um, one enzyme that you might have heard of that's responsible um, in diabetes called insulin. So your pancreas creates insulin and it secretes insulin and insulin is responsible for helping um, sugar get out of the bloodstream and into cells. So when sugar is in the bloodstream for a long time, that can be very damaging to the body, which is what happens in diabetes. But insulin Whenever you eat something very um, that's filled with sugar and your blood sugar rises, insulin is then secreted to help lower your blood sugar level and um, help that blood sugar get out into cells where it needs to be. 
So in, for example, type one diabetes, your pancreas just doesn't work right. So your pancreas isn't able to secrete the insulin that it needs to, to help maintain low um, and normal blood sugar levels. So in that case, um, people who have type one diabetes have to supplement um, with insulin. So either by pump or injections to help regulate their blood sugar levels. So their body can't make it on its own. So it's supplement supplemented with um, additional insulin to help regulate those blood sugar levels. The last organ for the digestive system on this pig is the parotid gland. So the parotid gland is located um, right back behind your jawbone, and it's responsible for secreting saliva. So whenever you see that delicious cheeseburger that you want to eat and your mouth starts watering, your parotid gland and your salivary glands are responsible for that. So your parotid gland and the saliva will um, lubricate your mouth and get basically get yourself ready to eat whatever you're about to eat. It also has enzymes, um, specifically amylase, which helps to break down carbohydrates. So for example, if you had um, a saltine cracker and you just put it in your mouth and you don't chew it, you just let it sit there and it breaks down, it'll dissolve because of the um, one, the moisture, and then that enzyme starting to break down that cracker before you even chew it, and before you even swallow it, and it goes through the whole digestive process. So that is the digestive system. If anybody has any questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat um, or unmute yourself and go ahead and ask whatever you want. There aren't any questions. The next system we're going to talk about is the um, cardiovascular and respiratory system. So that's mainly your heart and your lungs. So the first organ that we're going to talk about is the heart. So the heart uh, is responsible for pumping blood all throughout your body, and that blood is delivering oxygen to all of your tissues. So your heart is a muscle. Um, and it contracts just sort of like uh, the stomach that we talked about earlier and a little bit like the gallbladder. So it, that muscle pumps to get blood um, through all of the different chambers of the heart and then out of the heart. So you have two sides to your heart. You have the right side and the left side. They function independently of one another. So the right side of your heart is responsible for pumping blood and receiving blood or pumping blood, excuse me, to your lungs. So it's responsible for pumping blood to your lungs, which then can pick up oxygen. And the left side of your heart is responsible for pumping blood to the rest of your body. So if you were to cut open a heart um, and where you could visualize all four chambers, you would see that the muscle wall of the left side of the heart is thicker than the muscle wall of the right side of the heart. And it's just the same as um, any muscles that do a lot of work. So if you lift a lot of weights, your muscles are going to get bigger versus if you don't lift a lot of weights, your muscles might not get as big. So the left side of the heart is pumping blood um, to much greater distances. So that side of your heart is a little bit stronger. It's got a little bit bigger muscle. So if you ever see a heart um, that's cut in half where you can visualize all four chambers, that's a good way where you can identify the left side versus the right side of the heart. So um, if we were a red blood cell and we were going to take a journey through the heart, we would start in the right atrium. So those are the two chambers at the top of the heart that are responsible for receiving blood from the body. And from the right atrium, when it contracts, it goes to the right ventricle. And at this point, blood does not have oxygen and the blood needs to have oxygen to then be transported to tissues and deliver that oxygen. So the right ventricle contracts and um, through the pulmonary arteries, um, 
that blood goes to the lungs where it picks up oxygen, returns to the left atrium via pulmonary veins. The left atrium contracts, pushes blood to the left ventricle, and then the left ventricle contracts and pushes blood out via the aorta to your whole body. So um, there are arteries and veins that are responsible for transporting blood to and from the heart. So you might hear that arteries are responsible for carrying blood that has oxygen in it and veins are responsible for carrying blood that doesn't have oxygen in it. Well, that's not true. So arteries are responsible for taking blood away from the heart. So for example, um, the aorta artery, which is your largest artery in the body, takes blood away from the heart to the rest of your body. That blood has oxygen in it. But for example, the pulmonary arteries, which we talked about, takes blood away from the heart into your lungs. But that blood does not have oxygen in it. So arteries are, are responsible for carrying blood away from the heart. So artery with an A, away with an A, that's a good way to remember it. And then veins are responsible for bringing blood back to the heart. So in, um, so like what we talked about with pulmonary veins, so the blood that goes to the lungs has to come back to the heart. And the way that um, it gets back to the heart is through pulmonary veins. And that blood, because it just came from the lungs, has oxygen in it. So your heart um, is a muscle itself and muscles need oxygen too. So muscles need blood flow. So your heart needs blood flow too. So your heart has um, its own blood supply to itself to make sure that your heart muscle gets the oxygen it needs to be able to um, get nutrients and keep functioning normally. So let's say that you are um, 55, you're a 55 year old male who is obese and smokes cigarettes a lot and loves McDonald's cheeseburgers. The likelihood that something happens to you um, called a heart attack is a little bit higher. And so what happens in a heart attack is that the blood supply that your heart has, so the blood that feeds the heart muscle itself, one of those arteries gets constricted. So it gets closed off because um, of decades of smoking and uh, being overweight and genetics and eating food that's not good for you. It can close off those coronary arteries. So whenever those coronary arteries get closed off, blood is not able to reach a heart muscle. And if blood can't reach a muscle, then oxygen can't reach the muscle. If oxygen can't reach the muscle, those tissues can die. So that is very similar to if you have ever in gym class run like wind sprints where you have to run really, really fast and really, really hard for a short period of time. And then your muscles immediately start hurting because you have done a whole lot of work without all of the oxygen getting to those cells that needs to be there. So that is the same thing, the same reason why people who are having heart attacks have chest pain because the muscle, the heart itself is not getting the oxygen that it needs and it's painful. So it's very important that if somebody's having a heart attack um, to be able to go in and rectify that situation to, to stop that clot um, and make sure or try to help those muscle cells in the heart um, not die. The next um, organs that we're going to talk about are the lungs. So the first one we're going to do is the right lung. So the right lung has three lobes or little sections. So if you look at that, if you look at that lung, you're going to see three major sections to it. And that's just like it is in people. The right lung has three lobes and then the left lung has two. So your right lung and left lung do the same thing. They are responsible for um, gas exchange. So whenever blood gets to the lungs, it will pick up oxygen that then goes back to the heart to go to the rest of your body. So your tissues receive oxygen. And then blood that goes to the lungs also dumps off carbon dioxide, which you then breathe out as waste. So that is what happens, um, gas exchange happens in the lungs. So your right lung, like I said, has three lobes and then your left lung, which is the next organ, has two. So the reason that your left lung only has two lobes 
is because um, there is something else in your chest that's on the left side, um, that's on the left side that takes up some space and that's your heart. So your left lung only has two lobes, whereas your right lung has three because your heart takes up some of the space on the left side of your chest. So if you go to the doctor and they put the stethoscope on your back and are listening to your lungs, they're going to listen about five different places. They want to listen to every single lobe um, that you have between your lungs to make sure that air is circulating in all of those lobes. So they'll listen at two places right on the top of your shoulders and then one in the middle on the right side, which is the middle lung or the middle lobe of your right lung, and then two at the bottom. So you'll, you'll have um, the doctors listen to you five different places in your lungs just to make sure that all the air is moving that needs to be moving. So that was your left lung. Then the next organ is the diaphragm. So Brian's gonna put the left lung there. You can see it's two lobes. And then the diaphragm kind of looks like a dome. So your diaphragm is a big muscle that separates your thoracic cavity. So that's your rib cage area your, where your heart and lungs are located from your abdominal cavity, where all of the organs that we talked about with the digestive system are located, your stomach, your liver, all of that. So your diaphragm, um, like I said, it's a muscle. So it contracts just like your heart muscle does, just like your leg muscles do. And it's responsible for um, breathing. So your diaphragm, when it's relaxed, it looks like a dome. So when it's relaxed, it looks like a dome. When it contracts, it flattens out. So if you've ever seen um, a syringe, so if you have a syringe, like you take medicine out of and you push it, things go out. So either medicine goes out, water goes out, air goes out. Whereas if you pull it, air goes in or medicine goes in or water goes in. That principle is based on pressures. So when your diaphragm is relaxed and it's like a dome, it pushes air out because the pressure in your chest is greater than the pressure in the outside world. So the air that's in your chest runs out to try to equalize those pressures. Then when your diaphragm contracts, the air pressure in the outside world is greater than the air pressure in your chest. So air runs in. So your diaphragm um, is responsible for breathing. So you have some control over it. You can control if you are breathing um, really fast, you can control if you're trying to breathe really slow, but it also works independently. So it's involuntary. So you breathe whenever you're not even thinking about it. You breathe when you're sleeping and you breathe when you're working on homework and you're not thinking about breathing um, and your diaphragm is responsible for that. The next organ we're gonna talk about is the spleen. So the spleen is um, a, an organ that has a huge blood supply to it. So it's responsible for um, removing and recycling dead red blood cells. So if you um, heard the, our last lecture on um, blood typing, I had mentioned that red blood cells don't last forever. So you, the same, the red blood cells you're born with are not the same that you're going to die with. They have a short life cycle. It's about 120 days. So every 120 days, those red blood cells are uh, regenerated and then they have to go somewhere. So they go to the spleen to be recycled. So you, that means your spleen has a huge blood supply. So um, in one disease called mono. So if you've known somebody who's had mono or if you've had mono yourself, um, if you get mono and you go to the doctor, they're going to push on your belly a lot. And the reason they're going to push on your belly is because they want to see if your spleen is enlarged. So if your spleen swells up and they can feel that by pressing on your abdomen. So if your spleen is enlarged, then if you, for example, are playing uh, football, or soccer or basketball or any sport that has contact, high contact sports. And if your spleen is enlarged and you get tackled, your spleen could rupture. 
if your spleen ruptures, so it's just like a balloon, if you push it, it's gonna pop. If your spleen ruptures, that can cause um, a whole lot of internal bleeding because again, like we said, the spleen has a huge blood supply to it. So if you get mono, you're gonna have to be out of contact sports for an extended period of time because we don't want that to happen where your spleen gets enlarged, you get hit, you get tackled on the field, and then have um, any kind of major bleeding incident because your spleen then ruptures. The next organ that we're gonna talk about is the trachea. So the trachea is your windpipe. So if you feel on your own neck, if you feel right below your chin and where some people are where boys have their Adam's apple, and you feel lumps and bumps, that's your trachea. So your trachea is a tube that is not flexible like the esophagus. It stays open all the time because you're breathing all the time and you want your trachea to stay open. You don't want it to close or to be easily closed um, like the esophagus. So the, the reason um, that it is a stiff tube that is that stays open all the time is that there is cartilage that surrounds the whole tube going the whole way down. So you have cartilage in your nose, you have cartilage in your ears that if, for example, if I push my ear down, it's going to flop back. It's going to regain its shape. And the same thing happens with your trachea. You want it to stay open because you have to keep getting air from the outside world into your lungs to then go to the, your blood cells and be transported all across your body. So your trachea is responsible for getting for transporting that air from your nose and from your mouth to your lungs. The last organ is the larynx. So the larynx is also called your voice box. So it is um, right in the very back of your throat um, and it, ha it houses your vocal cords. So it's part of, um, it's where air runs over your vocal cords whenever you're talking and it creates the sound that your voice is. Um, and it's also part of the body systems that we're talking about today. So that's it for the cardiovascular and respiratory system. Does anybody have any questions about any of the organs that we talked about today? If you don't have any questions about the pig dissections, do you have any questions for Misty in general? She's a good person um, to talk to about health careers or you know, education requirements and that sort of thing. Do you have any questions regarding a health career? Feel free to ask Misty. Yeah, you can ask me anything in the whole wide world. I promise I don't bite. No questions at all? Nobody? They know everything already, which is good. Promising future for us all. What's the difference between an emergency medicine doctor and a trauma surgeon? I know a that's, little bit. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, so I'm sure that there are a whole lot of very specific things that are differences between them. Um, but one is that emergency med medicine doctors are, so for example, the people that you see in the emergency room aren't trained as surgeons. So if you're going to be a trauma surgeon, then you, after you graduate medical school, um, go to your residency where you train to be a surgeon. So you work in the operating room and, um, but you will specifically work with things that are trauma related. So not, for example, just taken out a gallbladder for a routine surgery. It might, it'll be more things like car accidents or gunshots or um, things that are very traumatic injuries. Um, whereas an emergency room doctor, you're gonna learn literally everything about a person because any person 
can walk into the emergency room and they can be having a stroke or a heart attack or um, a broken arm, anything and everything comes into the emergency room. So, and you work to be the person to try and stabilize um, that patient to either leave the emergency room or get to the operating room if they need to be, um, or go to the hospital for, or stay in the hospital for any other number of reasons. So those are some of the differences um, in what they do day to day, but also their training is completely different. So if you're in the emergency room, you work in the emergency room. If you're a trauma surgeon, you work in the operating room. Um, does that answer your question a little bit? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so also, both of them, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, so you typically wouldn't find a trauma surgeon in the ER. Right. So it would depend on the case. So if somebody comes into the emergency room who has had, for example, a gunshot wound, they're going to come into the emergency room first. The emergency room doctor, that position is going to examine the patient, um, do whatever they can in the interim. And then if they think that that person needs to be seen by a trauma surgeon, then the trauma surgeon will um, work with that patient, evaluate that patient, and then do whatever kind of procedures need to be done. So they can interact a lot because it, it seems, you know, a lot of traumatic injuries um, first come through the emergency room, uh, but not everything that goes into the emergency room has to be dealt with by a trauma surgeon. Does that make sense? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Did y'all take the poll? I think it's everybody painless. seen it come up. If everybody could just run through the poll very quickly and just stay stay on the line just a few more minutes and I will share your certificate of completion in case you need to turn that into a teacher. You can screenshot it or take a picture of it. If any of you all are interested in playing around, that software that Misty just used um, does a whole lot more than what we have time to go through. So we don't want to hold you all for an hour and a half or two hours to go through all the anatomy. But if you'd like to take a look at that software, you can email me and I will send you a link. So what I have to do is create a username and password and then it'll expire after a certain amount of time because we have to buy a license to this particular software. But if you'd like to play around with it, just let me know. There's my email in the chat. I hope you all enjoyed this. On the snowy, cold day. We got another question in the chat, Misty. Um, any other common diseases that impact the spleen in a similar way to mono? I'm sure that there are, but mono is the one that I know most about. Um, so I can't tell you off the top of my head that there, I can't tell you another one off the top of my head, but I'm sure that there are. And the best way to look up what some of those would be is just really to Google it. So Google diseases that affect the spleen um, and you can see how, what symptoms you would have if something was affected in your spleen, how somebody would diagnose it to figure out that that's what's going on, um, and then whatever treatment would be necessary for whatever disease that you're looking at. So um, mono is the one I know best, so I don't know that I could, I could help you a whole lot with that question, but thank you for asking. I'm going to go ahead and share your certificate. Can you close the poll, poll please, Brown? It should be closed. Okay, it's telling me not. Let's try it again. There we go. Team Center tour next week. You can next Tuesday afternoon to virtually tour our simulation center. We'd love to have you at four o'clock. Otherwise, thanks so much Thank for joining you. us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye.